Good evening, and welcome to UXPA's An Evening in Design. It is my immense pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Carol Smith. Carol has been conducting UX research for over 20 years across multiple industries. She was an UXPA international board member and continues to be an active member and volunteer. She is currently working in the AI division of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute as a senior research scientist within human-machine interaction. Carol, welcome, and in your own time. So today I will be uh, talking about designing for human-centered AI, and a lot of this is uh, covering uh, you know, the best practices that we already follow, but there are some significant differences when it comes to AI systems. Uh, a bit about this being approved for public access. I do want to acknowledge the land that I speak on. Uh, this is the land of the Monongahela, the Adena, and Hopewell nations, the Seneca, Lenape, and Shawnee lands, and the Osage, Delaware, and Iroquois lands, and is now known as Pittsburgh, PA. And I uh, obviously do this to recognize the contributions that all these people have made to this area and continue to make. Uh, it's never enough to acknowledge our land, but I do feel like it's an important piece, particularly because I will be talking about uh, ethics and the bias that's in the systems that we make and how we can protect people. Uh, but we've been making machines for a very, very long time. Um, hundreds of years ago, this is an image from, uh, or a painting from uh, 1206, where uh, Al Jazari was talking about or describing a water powered automated orchestra. So this machine would use the power of water to make music and people would be able to enjoy that uh, sound and, and the beauty of being on the water. Um, as an experience that was made for their enjoyment, but was made uh, for a machine to uh, help us to enjoy ourselves. So, so these are things that we've been doing for a very long time, trying to make things easier for ourselves, trying to do things that we couldn't already do um, with the, uh, the skills that we have ourselves. And you can imagine that things change quickly when we get to these much more complex systems. Um, so those machines uh, were not autonomous in the sense of doing things that weren't explicitly uh, told to do. So, so systems, even AI systems today, can't do anything that we don't design them to do, but they can find meaning or patterns that we may or may not have already previously known about. Um, in this example of a medical screening, you can imagine that the physician needs to think about the information being clear, being transparent to them as far as what it is, what the information is that they are uh, gleaning from it, and to be able to trust that system. System. The patient needs to be able to trust that not only the surgeon and the, uh, the care uh, technician there are doing the right thing, but also that the machinery is doing what it is supposed to do, that the, the systems are working properly. And then the technician also has to have a level of understanding and trust of the system. So all these individuals have different relationships to the systems that they're working with, and their different levels of trust and different levels of information that they each need to make this experience successful. Whether or not not these systems contain AI is, is certainly debatable, but the general idea of complex systems uh, is represented well with this idea. And so we want to make these systems humane. We want to make them human-centered. And a good a framework that I like to start with is the user experience honeycomb that Peter Morville developed. And these uh, ideas of useful, desirable, valuable are really strong throughout any system that we're making. But how do we apply these to human-centered AI? And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So a lot of this is broadening our work, really understanding what AI is, first of all, and then looking at the system and the challenge that we're facing and determining if it really is something that can be solved with an AI system. What kind of improvements we expect, how uh, we can identify the benefits and the risks of these systems, and then how we know that we've actually done what we intended to do. How do we know that we've made improvements? We need benchmarks of the current situation to know that we actually were successful. And so of course we want to design these systems to work with and for people. And uh, we want to make sure that they're effective 
in a variety of different ways that you can measure that, and that we're minimizing any unintended consequences. So there are three areas I'll be talking about today, and these are also uh, the paper on the right, the human-centered AI, uh, the definition of that um, is in a paper that we released last year um, from the Software Engineering Institute. And the three areas are understanding the complexity of context, so really understanding what is going on in the situation now, uh, designing for humans and machines to team to work together, and then engaging in critical oversight. So first we'll get into the complexity of context. And this is really about thinking about what changes during the interactions, the desired outcome and the human's needs, which is something that's very, very uh, dear to those of us in this, this room tonight, or these rooms, I should say, um, the uh, human and contextual factors and how that's going to affect the outcome. And uh, the human and the AI, the, the partnership there, how do, does the human or the AI learn when shifts in context have occurred? What happens when the situation changes? How do we maintain clarity around operational intent? If, if something changes with the actual use, what, how do we communicate that between the two um, or five, how, however many individuals and machines we're talking about? And how do we adapt and evolve these systems based on dynamic context? So when things are changing, uh, constantly, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, autonomous vehicles, semi-autonomous vehicles uh, in a little bit, but thinking about what is changing in the, the context, what is changing in the environment, and how the system needs to respond, and how the human might respond, and how the two then are exchanging information and working together. So the complexity is broad. We're talking about sometimes environmental context. So if these systems are in the physical world, uh, there are a lot of different things. A lot of the uh, systems in our homes might be uh, might have some AI in them and need to understand the context of their use or Roomba even uh, understanding when uh, something has been moved might be important. Uh, the human factors, what is the, the state of mind of the individual? What do they know? What are they aware of? What can they do with the information provided to them? And then the information in general, what data is available, what information is available to the system and to the human, and that exchange that needs to occur. And so in this image, we uh, can imagine that there's a lot going on. There's been some kind of, kind of disaster. Humans are working on one particular situation, and these machines are maybe collecting data. One is perhaps carrying uh, someone. And, and so there's a lot of interactions and with machinery, obviously, there's a lot of added danger because uh, machines and uh, bags of water don't mix well. And uh, so we need to really think about safety concerns here as well. So there are a lot of collaborative activities that need to occur and there are a lot of different aspects um, to think about with regard to these systems. So uh, this is uh, looking at really what are those um, interactions that need to occur in the, the components there. And you can see there, there are six main components that are talked about in this uh, particular graphic. And I, I think it's a good framework to, for thinking about this work. Security, adaptability, communication, explainability, training and knowledge and assessment. Um, and the term explainability may be one that you've heard in the past. That's a, actually a term DARPA is using for a bigger project that they're working on for um, both the people working on the system, having an explainable system, as well as the people using the system, being able to understand the system at an appropriate level. Um, so that word can be a loaded term, but this covers kind of the, the broad aspects of these interactions um, that need to occur. And so something else to think about are the time cycles. So the lengths of the interactions, if they're short and hectic, that's very different than a system that you're building for a longer, more cyclical um, interaction. Something that is occurring as a long process is occurring. It, the medical uh, situation might be as a patient is progressing through a treatment. And uh, there is a difference between how much iteration occurs in the system or in the uh, relationship. How often are, uh, is information being added to the system of perhaps affecting that, that interaction? And all of this requires clear communication, negotiation, and coordination between the human and the AI. And again, these can be much more complex systems. I'm mostly going to talk about the one-to-one -one relationship, but you certainly can have many humans interacting with one AI 
uh, one human interacting with many AIs and, and, and on and on. Um, and we, this is uh, from a presentation that Dwayne Degler and I did uh, last year at the Information Architecture Conference. And that's online if, if you're curious to dig into the time cycles more. So an example, I, I mentioned semi-autonomous uh, vehicles. You can imagine these uh, vehicles have to not only have a huge amount of information about the context, but they also need to think about, or they don't think, but they, they need to respond to the driver's behavior, the weather changes. Uh, in, in this case, this street painting appeared on my street last year unexpectedly and without any signage to indicate what it meant in the context of my street. Um, changes in the desired route. So if the human decides they want to go a different way, how, how is that exchange communicated to a vehicle that is currently in an autonomous setting? Uh, highway versus city driving, those are clearly extremely different situations. Uh, and then emergent situations, what occurs, how do those uh, systems respond when there's an emergency, if a transition needs to occur between the human driver and the uh, vehicle, how is that handoff uh, maintained or, or, or transitioned, and how do you make that successful? Um, and th those are huge issues uh, within the uh, semi-autonomous uh, industry. Another example, uh, thinking about medical treatment, uh, would be thinking about how much information is already known about the patient or about the situation, uh, the specifics of the patient's health. So they start with one stage of disease, for example. What happens as that progresses, as information changes? What is the family's situation? Are they, do they have support? Do they have someone who can help them? Um, and their insurance status, how are they gonna pay for the treatments? All of these different factors might feed into the system and might very much change what is um, recommended if the system is recommending a treatment. Um, it may be very highly affected by this different information. So how do you inform the system of this information? And then as new information uh, becomes available, how is that integrated and how might that change those interactions? What would change between one particular uh, patient situation and another, um, depending on the information that's available? And so we want to make sure that we're keeping uh, everyone safe with these systems. And so we need to think about what actions are needed to get into or to maintain a safe state. Those should be easy to do. Um, so when we're dealing with a system where there could be a potential to um, have a, um, a poor state or a, an unpleasant state of the system or a dangerous state, um, anything that can lead to an unsafe situation, that should be hard to do. So we want those two, we want to think about those different modes or those different states um, when we're building the system and not rely on the operator's ability to detect errors. Um, so for example, with the uh, semi-autonomous vehicles, we don't want the human to have to recover uh, power, control or anything else before an accident. If it's a very urgent situation, we need better uh, planning for those types of situations and not to have an operator think about ahead something that's about to happen, but rather prevent that as much as possible. So making these systems effective as team players is, is uh, something that needs to be considered well ahead of time as well. How are we going to indicate the ability for the human to direct the system? How easy is it going to be to direct them? How observable is its behavior? Is a human really able to uh, observe the system and understand what it is doing and vice versa is the AI system able to observe the human and understand what their situation is. Um, thinking about the ease and efficiency of direction just in general, how do I uh, communicate to a, uh, a, a, if it's a fully autonomous vehicle and I need to go back to get something I forgot, how do I communicate that to the system? And then particularly during busy and novel episodes, really thinking about how to, how to direct, how to communicate between those systems, the human and the machine is really important. Um, particularly if you anticipate that the people involved are going to be emotionally charged, if they're going to be very stressed, if they're gonna be sleep deprived, those are situations where it's even more important to really pay attention to ease of use. And that doesn't mean it's simple, but it should be very easy again to do the safer thing or to, to get into a safer situation. Um, and, and thinking about that is really important in an early 
uh, time in the development. We want to capitalize on human strengths. Uh, Mary Cummings, uh, Missy uh, Cummings uh, identified uh, this list um, in 2004, and, and this is building on Fitz's list uh, that, that had been done many years before. Um, and humans, she identified, and um, actually working on re revisiting these lists, but, but I think it's a pretty solid list. Humans right now uh, are considered to be better at perceiving patterns, improvising, and using flexible procedures, recalling relevant facts at the appropriate time, reasoning inductively, and exercising judgment. And we can debate this, but to, but these are the things that humans are um, generally better at than a machine or an AI system. And so when we're building a system, we probably want to rely on the human to do these types of activities and think about how the machine, how this AI system can complement that. What can the machine do better to support the human at things that they're not as strong at, at things that they're not likely to be as quick with? Um, and that's a really important aspect of these systems is that balance. So context is really about research to understand the complexity, that environment, the human, and the information that's available, and what changes, and to inform and support designs that provide clear communication, negotiation, and coordination, those opportunities for the two to really work together and, uh, and ensure that there's really clear information. There are a lot of challenges with this work. Um, so the first is, of course, demystifying AI to ourselves and our colleagues. What, what is the system? What is it capable of? Gain the time and the budget for UX research, which is always a challenge. Using uh, the existing patterns we have available to us wisely, making sure that we're really using the best practices that we have uh, to do this work. And then understanding what is going to change in the system with regard to interactions. So I uh, haven't seen any questions, so I'm gonna plow ahead uh, and uh, talk about designing for human machine teaming, which is building on a lot of what I've already covered. So this is the interdependence piece. This is where people are interacting with and understanding systems, and the system to some extent is understanding the human. And we're gaining appropriate levels of trust, um, our calibrated levels of trust, and we're designing AI systems that provide transparency regarding their limitations. And this is a really important aspect of any AI system is making sure that humans understand what it can and cannot do. And again, this is uh, covered in that white paper um, from last year. So I hope we are all aware AI is not sentient or unknowable. Uh, these systems are very uh, complex. They are uh, often, uh, we want them to uh, provide information that we didn't previously have and to show us those patterns that we didn't see. However, they are able to, it's able, it's possible for someone who builds these systems to tell us why and how things uh, were decided or recommended. Um, if someone is describing something that is indecipherable, if they're they're using uh, the term black box, which I, I don't like to use because it's not even a clear term, um, it, that's not helpful and that's not accurate. Um, we need to be able to control and monitor these systems and we need to be able to diagnose what the system is doing and why, even if it is after the fact. Um, so providing transparency regarding those AI limitations, the boundaries, unfamiliar scenarios, things that are going to create um, a, uh, a situation where the AI system is not going to be performing at the level we expect, that's really an important part of building a good system. Uh, we also need to understand the provenance of the data. What is the system uh, basing its recommendations on? Where is the information being gathered from? How recent is it? How accurate is it? Uh, is it information or data that is uh, recognized by the uh, industry that is being used for? Uh, that information is really important to build a good system. We are all, unfortunately, affected by automation bias, and this is the propensity for us to favor suggestions from automated decision-making systems and to ignore contradictory information that's not made with automation, even if it's correct. And we see this even in simply people uh, browsing the internet and uh, finding something and assuming it's accurate um, because it's on the computer screen. Unfortunately, we are very easily convinced by things that are seemingly smart. And uh, this is something that we really need to pay attention to um, in our design. And part of this is about trust. Trust is a continuum. So on the far left 
here we see trust is, uh, is distrust, where trust is falling short of the system capabilities. So people don't believe it's capable of doing what it is supposed to do. And so that leads to disuse. No one's gonna use it. It clearly doesn't work well. It's not accurate. Whatever it is that they're, they're trying to do, they don't believe the system is doing properly. On the other end of the spectrum, we have overtrust where people are exceeding the system capabilities or, or you know their trust of it is well beyond what it's capable of doing and leads to misuse. And we see this with people overtrusting all sorts of systems uh, that are unfortunately very um, biased in nature or just simply not able to do the task at hand. And then in the middle is a calibrated or appropriate trust where the trust matches the system capabilities and leads to appropriate use. And that's our goal. Our goal is always for calibrated trust where people understand these systems well enough to understand what it can and cannot do and how it is supposed to work within the context that's being used in and, and that it was designed for obviously. And trust changes over time. So you can imagine uh, perhaps a new uh, user of a system, their first experience might be at an appropriate or a calibrated level of trust. And then as they work with the system, that level of trust might change and might actually end up being a little bit higher, but still within a uh, you know, calibrated level. Another uh, individual might come in uh, to a system over trusting it, thinking that it can do um, all sorts of things, uh, particularly, uh, unfortunately, we see this with um, uh, vehicles labeled full self-driving and, and things like that, where the uh, capabilities are overstated and people overly trust the systems resulting, unfortunately, in, in uh, very negative consequences. And hopefully over time, learning the limitations of the system, people have more of a calibrated level of trust. And then individuals coming in with a very low trust, a distrust of the system, hopefully can gain more trust. And this is going to be different depending on your audience, depending on the people you're designing the system for. And it's really important to understand the individuals that you're trying to design the system for, what level of trust they already have of these types of systems. Um, you can uh, imagine in some situations, they may be concerned about their job security. They may be concerned about uh, all kinds of um, um, privacy issues, that sort of thing. Really understanding that's gonna help to build a really good system. But skepticism and speculation are what keep people safe. We do want to embrace the ideas of people uh, asking hard questions and really looking critically at these systems. Um, in 1983, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Petrov uh, stopped a uh, potential nuclear disaster. The uh, system he was using was new and he did not trust it. And it identified incoming uh, missiles and he had no other source of information to confirm that, uh, that report and ignored it. And thankfully he did um, because the system was not uh, re giving him information that was accurate. And so, uh, you know, that kind of skepticism is important in systems. And he uh, had a healthy level of skepticism, thankfully. And we, we want more people like that. Um, and the way to do this is to encourage and activate curiosity. So us conducting activities such as abusability testing that was coined by Dan Brown and Black Mirror episodes uh, that Casey Feisler uh, populated uh, or popularized. This is from the uh, British dystopian sci-fi series of the same name. These kinds of activities, uh, I'm not gonna get into them very much today. I'll, I'll touch on them a little, but they really help us to speculate about system misuse and abuse, thinking ahead, thinking about those worst case scenarios and the potential unintended and unwanted consequences that the systems may have. And this can help us to prevent and ideally, ideally prevent, and if not uh, mitigate any harms that, that the systems can uh, create. Uh, Dr. Ayanna Howard talks about rewarding teams for finding ethical bugs. And this is another way to really embrace the idea of thinking, thinking ahead, thinking about consequences and working to prevent negative consequences in any system we're working with. All of this is about conversations for understanding, sitting down with the team, talking about uh, things such as what we value, who could be hurt, what lines our AI will not cross, how are we shifting power, who's gaining and who is losing power. Um, that's uh, something that Pratyusha uh, Kaluri uh, talks about, uh, talked about in the Nature um, article. 
and how we track our progress and what is the perspective of the frequently marginalized groups that will be either subject to the system or using the system and how might that um, affect them uh, potentially in perpetuating uh, harms to those groups. So really thinking about these broad uh, questions is an important aspect of making any type of system that's going to be used by broad audiences and, and even in narrow situations as well. And this is really new, uncomfortable work for the most of our colleagues. Um, this audience may be comfortable with these uh, conversations, but most people are not. And we need to help them be uncomfortable and to learn to really get into the nitty gritty to get their hands uh, sticky, if you will. This uh, work is not superficial. Ethical design is not superficial. Uh, Laura Kalbach talks about this. It's really important to uh, be willing to do this hard work. So we want to, uh, one, one really good way to do this is to adopt technology ethics. There are many, many different sets out there. Uh, the Montreal Declaration for Responsible AI is the one I usually recommend people start with because it's very broad, but also covers uh, really important aspects of making technology. And the reason to adopt ethics is because it harmonizes the cultural variations that we have on our teams. Ideally, we have very diverse teams who come from very diverse backgrounds. They have different educational experiences, different knowledge, different skills. And we want to harmonize that experience uh, for everyone so that we all understand what we are building and, and what we are valuing during that work. And this also can help you to balance the pace of change. Industry pressure is to release, release, release. And uh, AI systems really do need a little bit more time to consider the implications and think through the consequences. And this gives explicit permission for everyone to do that work, to really question the breadth of implications for the systems that they're making. There are uh, a lot of different tools out there to help prompt these conversations. This is a checklist I developed a few years ago. And the idea is that these are paired with technical ethics and that you have these conversations. Don't just check a box, but really dive into that topic. What is it that we need to do to make this system work the way we want it to? What is it about the data that we need to explore to make sure that it's doing, uh, that it is integrated in a way that is sensible and that is going to provide the results that we need? Um, and we want to do this work so we can bridge the gap between statements that you might find in some of these uh, ethical uh, sets, the, the principles that states things like do no harm. Um, how do you apply that to a software product? Um, and really diving into what does that mean in this context? What does that mean for the users um, and the people who are affected by the system? And all of this is, of course, to reduce risk and unwanted bias and to support the inspection and mitigation planning, with the result typically being a list of activities that need to be done to further inform the system. This is a, a framework, the UX framework for designing trustworthy AI that uh, helps to kind of frame these ideas uh, into buckets uh, that are a little bit more approachable. Uh, so accountable to humans, cognizant of speculative risks and benefits. I'm gonna get into these in a minute. Um, and, and these slides will be made available as well. So you don't need to write these down. Um, respectful and secure, and then uh, honest and usable. And so I wanna introduce a scenario and then I'll, I'll get into those four aspects. Uh, the right staff scenario, it's an AI shift scheduling system. So the goal with the system is to improve staffing decisions and scheduling for fast food restaurants. So if you can imagine a store manager in a fast food restaurant is typically scheduling the uh, people that they like or the people who have easier schedules into the best uh, shifts. So, so they're um, biased in that sense with, you know, the, the obvious challenges of working a restaurant. And uh, we want to create a system that's going to reduce the bias of shift selection and, again, make it more uh, quick so that everyone has not only a better opportunity at shifts, but that they know their schedule more quickly. So with the system, um, thinking about the first area of accountable to humans, we want to ensure that humans have ultimate control and they're able to monitor and control risk. And we wanna make sure that humans are always responsible for any final decisions that have to do with a person's life, their quality of life, their health and their reputation. So thinking about uh, that system, uh, we wanna make sure first of all that humans can always unplug the machines. This is a Grady Beach quote from a TED talk that he did a couple of years ago. Um, so making sure that they can actually 
turn the system off if it's not working. That's really important. Uh, we do not need any bad uh, sci-fi endings to our, our systems. And uh, also thinking about the significant decisions that the system makes being explained, able to be overridden and appealable and reversible. So with, with right staff, this is really the manager being able to reschedule people as needed. So if someone comes in uh, and uh, you know is available and they have uh, a need, they should be able to put that person into the shift on the spot as they would in a normal situation. The system should not be uh, onerous in that way. So, and, and they should also, the manager should also understand if the AI system has completely changed the schedule um, in a dramatic way, uh, either understand why to, to get the explanation, but also be able to override that um, or reverse to revert to a previous version um, as needed. So those responsibilities uh, and the limitations of them also need to be very explicit with us uh, to work for the relationship to work. So with right staff, thinking about who would pick people to schedule, who would who would assign individuals to a shift or to a, a week of work? Would that be the AI system or the manager? And how is that managed? Who would define the shifts that are available? Uh, would that be the AI system or the manager? And then thinking about integrating new information. Would the AI system be de dealing with sick time and resignations or with the manager? And just thinking through these little pieces can help to define better what the system will do, what it won't do, and how the individuals interacting with it are going to um, give it more information and get information from it. So thinking about abusability testing, if we wanted to add a feature to enable right staff to turn off by itself, for whatever reason, um, what would be the limits to that functionality? When would it be allowed to do that action? What would uh, be communicated? Who would learn about it being turned off? And how might this be abused or misused? What are the implications and the risks of it turning itself off? Just having these activities that we think through is a really great way to uh, prevent, again, prevent harm or to uh, prepare for mitigation strategies um, if there are things that can be abused or misused and also not prevented. The second area is thinking about cogn being cognizant of speculative risks and benefits. And this is where we want to make sure that we're identifying a full range of harmful and malicious use, but also the well, the uh, good and beneficial uses of these systems. We want to make sure that we're aware of all the unwanted or unintended consequences in particular. And speculation can be through a variety of different activities. The uh, abusability testing being a really good example of that. And on the right is a screenshot from one I did in a workshop a few years ago here in Pittsburgh. And these speculation activities, again, help us to really identify the potential severe situations, but also thinking about less severe ones that we still want to prevent or need to mitigate for. And thinking specifically about those people who are in groups that are frequently marginalized is really important for these activities as well. The Black Mirror episodes are usually those extreme activities. And uh, this is supposed to be fun and engaging. You can see here um, you know, drawings and being creative in this work is important because it's, you know, if you have a dark sense of humor like I do, it's, it's fun, but also you are going to be more creative when you're having fun. And so we want people to be engaged and really thinking very broadly about uh, the situation and, and the, uh, the system that's being built. So that Black Mirror episode for this system might be that right staff begins prioritizing people with easier schedules. And then the managers start approving those schedules and it gets reinforced, that bias continues to be reinforced. So people who were previously discriminated against are still being discriminated against. Um, and there are many other things you can think about um, with the system when it could go awry. And uh, just identifying those is really important and thinking about how to build the system in ways that that will not be an issue. So one piece of this that's very important is creating those communication and mitigation plans ahead of time. So really planning for any unwanted consequences that can't be prevented and thinking about who can report them, who would they report them to? Can the system be turned off? Uh, if not, how are you going to be able to revert to a previous version or do some sort of other activity to pre prevent further harm? 
who gets notified and what are the consequences of that work. And the reason why this is so important is uh, if you think back to Microsoft's Tay uh, Twitter bot, that went on for a day and a half or so before they it was turned off. And that type of situation should have been addressed much more quickly. They should have had a plan. Uh, these It does not take a lot of an imagination to think about uh, situations that can go poorly. Um, and it's a really important aspect. I see a chat. Um, the shift scheduling example is dehumanizing of the shift manager. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, th these are great points. Yes. They're, they're, I'm not suggesting that's an excellent example, just one that's easy for people to, uh, to understand. And I totally agree. <laughs> um, excellent. So uh, respectful and secure is the uh, third area. And this is about the values of humanity, ethics, equity, fairness, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion. And it's about respecting the privacy and data rights and making robust, valid, and reliable systems. So there's a lot of, those words mean a lot of different things in a lot of different uh, places, but we're, we're talking broadly about uh, making sure it's a, a system that is uh, well-built and uh, making sure that the security is understandable as well. So with respectful and secure and right staff, thinking about who has visibility to reasons for changing schedules. So who, uh, particularly with privacy issues, we want to think about if someone has a doctor's appointment, how is that documented in a way that protects that individual's information? Um, how might that information be used in the future? And how are we protecting the privacy of those individuals that, that are affected? Um, so you know, really making sure that only the information that needs to be in the system is in the system. So an example is social security numbers. Do those ever need to be in the system? why would we ever want to collect that information except at the time of hiring? Um, the, the type, there are a lot of pieces of information that um, are casually collected and how can we reduce the amount of information collected to ensure that we are really making a system that's secure and protecting people. And honest and usable is the last piece where we're valuing transparency with the goal of engendering appropriate trust and explicitly stating the identity as an AI system. So this isn't quite as important with right staff, um, but uh, we wanna make sure that particularly with a chatbot, a voice system, that people are aware that they are dealing with an AI system and, and similarly with video as well. Um, we wanna make sure that any known bias is identified and, and the people are aware of the bias in the system. Not all bias is negative. Um, and we want to acknowledge any issues that are um, concerning in the system and over communicate in general on any issues in the system. So for right staff, the system is built to reduce the known bias in existing data, we hope. And uh, we want it to be easy for people to report bias or to prevent it ideally. Um, but by allowing anyone who interacts with the system to report any biases, it starts to hopefully be better um, as a system. And again, I, I acknowledge there are many issues with this, uh, this as an example. <laughs> Um, so design for human machine teaming is about providing transparency regarding AI limitations, the, identifying those boundaries, those unfamiliar scenarios, situations that are going to be uh, unsuccessful for the system, encouraging appropriate trust, speculating about misuse and abuse, and preventing or planning to mitigate uh, any situation. And the challenges here are that we need more speculative activities. There, there really aren't a lot. I'm working on a project right now to identify and develop more. Um, and any work that you can do to add to this buy-in knowledge is really helpful. We want to engage people in this hard and necessary work. And uh, we need to build on our experiences of trying to get um, UX user experience work, human computer interaction work, and accessibility into um, existing uh, workflows, which has always been a challenge. And uh, AI systems are not fully able to team with humans yet. So a lot of this is speculative in itself, um, but we need to be ready. We need to start the work now to really make sure that we're ready for these challenges and thinking ahead of the actual development of them. So the last piece is engaging in critical oversight. And uh, this is really thinking through what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And for whom are we doing? 
uh, this work and uh, really making sure that we are continuously uh, examining the system, proactively considering risks and very aware of what the system is doing and why. Data is the key to any AI system. We really need to understand the data at a deep level. It cannot be a situation where you just think about the data after the fact, build an AI system and then plug in the data. Uh, that is a, a big warning sign if people are talking about doing that around you. Um, the importance of the provenance and of the data and the creator's motivation is exceptionally important because all data is created by humans, all data is biased. There is a reason why that data was collected. There's a reason why some data was not collected or wasn't included in the data set. Understanding the reasonings for that is really important. Uh, there are a number of wonderful um, ways of looking at data and models as well, data sheets for data sets and model cards for ML systems, um, both of those papers uh, and a variety of uh, tools have been built around them uh, that are really good ways to start doing this work of, of querying your data. So you may wonder how can data be biased? <laughs> um, if we think about a lawn care system, a lawn care company that wants to create a system to select the right lawn care treatment to save time uh, for the people in the field, um, they may have multiple data source choices. So they may have uh, a lot of companies that want the system and are willing to provide the data to make the system. So if they look at companies A information, company A's information, they primarily use chemicals to treat lawns and the data is likely biased towards chemical use. So, so they are aware of the, um, that company's information. And then company B, only uses what they call all natural treatments. And so they, the assumption or, or the knowledge of this data is it's likely biased against chemical use. So which one's the right one to use? And the answer is that, that neither are wrong. Both are biased, they're biased in different ways. And it really depends on the system and who you're building the system for. Are the majority of the companies will use the system more like company A or company B? And that is how you determine what data to use. Um, bias is in the data, it's potentially in the algorithm selection and that combination and can be in the training as well. And some of it's unintended and some of it is purposeful and really understanding how that can affect the misuse and abuse of the system and the uh, inherent bias that is in the data is again, just a hugely important piece of building these systems. The motivation, the composition of the data, the collection processes that were used, what the recommended use of the data is, all of these are important. Our goal is really to make systems that are transparent and accountable. And the best way to do that is to really dig into the actual back end of these systems and how they're built. An example uh, of training, um, if you think about tomato, um, they are usually located with vegetables in the grocery stores I frequent, and uh, they are fruit. <laughs> so depending on if you're building the system for a grocery store or if you're building a system for a scientist or some other use, different labels or different categories may be applied to the same item and really being very clear about what it is you're doing and why is an important aspect of then being able to build a successful system that identifies a tomato accurately or whatever it is you're doing. One more example of uh, image recognition here, uh, training data and the data encountered may be the same. So we have a red, a green, and a white car. And data that is encountered in the environment is red, green, and white. The system is likely to be um, very good at identifying those vehicles. However, the systems really only know what they're taught. And so if they are taught with that same set of data, but the data they encounter in the uh, in the uh, field is blue, if they see blue cars, um, then the initial data, the trained data is unrepresentative or incomplete as compared to what is being encountered. And so it's less likely that the system is going to be able to recognize those blue vehicles. Not impossible, but less likely. You can also imagine if all of the vehicles are um, in bright sunny locations, and then the data that's being encountered is in the snow or the mud or rain or uh, the data train, training data is in the desert, but the uh, encountered data is in a very lush green place. That can confuse a system very easily. So being really, really aware of what you're teaching and how that potentially is going to 
change what the capabilities of the system are, are really, it's really an important area to understand. Uh, Joy Bolomini, uh, she's with the Algorithmic Justice League. She created the Algorithmic Justice League. And uh, she talks about the fact that data is a function of our history and the past dwells within our algorithms, showing us the inequalities that have always been there. Uh, there's an excellent movie called Coded Gaze. I highly recommend you spend an evening watching it. She's uh, really good at explaining the, the problems with uh, these systems and uh, an advocate for AI, certainly, but, but uh, responsible AI. Um, and a lot of this is really um, reliant on you working with leaders who are establishing psychological safety so that you can ask really difficult questions and you can be backed up in your uh, desire to make a really good system. Um, yes, face recognition is an, yes is a is a big uh, big area of, of her um, focus and a huge problematic uh, technology. Um, yeah, so so really um, being able to speak up and talk about these things is really important, and so making sure that the people that you're working for and with uh, are open to that is really important. And a diverse team is equally important. There's a lot of research showing that diverse teams do much better work because they're more aware of their own biases. Um, regular auditing needs to occur. Um, AI should not be assumed to be stable. It's dynamic. Uh, as soon as new information is introduced to the system, it's potentially a different system. Uh, these systems require continuous human oversight. Uh, you will not generally save a lot of money from creating an AI system because you're creating a system that needs constant uh, work and constant um, observation and, and uh, monitoring. These systems need to be probed with hypo hypothetical cases. They need to be checked for bias and brittleness and, and all kinds of issues with distribution shift as the system uh, gains new information and is exposed to different situations. And uh, being able to access the history of the system's operation and usage is important, but you also need to consider the ethics with regard to that. So there's, there's just a lot of complexity with any large complex system. So many, many challenges here as well. We need to broaden our work. We need to really look at uh, data, dynamic data and our dynamic outcomes. What are we going to do with that information? How is the interaction changing? Um, and is there appropriate or calibrated trust? And if not, how do we make the system in such a way that it is calibrated appropriately? Did the system uh, respond appropriately given the situation? How do we know that that has happened? How do we recognize that? And how can we measure if the AI is an effective collaborator, if it's really supporting the work, if it's improving the situation? So first doing some baseline work and then figuring out how to measure that as the system uh, changes. So defining those standards, the methods and processes we need to evaluate system outcomes and support humans in partnering with these systems. Uh, is, is a huge challenge that's coming up. Uh, and, and hopefully you all join me in that and, uh, and start working to build uh, more tools. Uh, this is uh, a report that I worked on just very recently in November, this was released. This is the uh, Defense Innovation Unit's Responsible AI Guidelines. Um, so the Department of Defense in the US uh, created a set of ethical principles for AI. Uh, and the uh, this is a way to actually operationalize them to make them more work for AI systems. And so you can go to this website and uh, download the report and some worksheets that can help you to do responsible AI work. Um, and the worksheets are pretty, uh, we tried to make them very plain language and take you through the steps. So there's um, planning and development and deployment activities um, in each of these worksheets to help your teams to create responsible AI. AI has great potential, but we have to develop it with caution. Uh, one of uh, the Defense Innovation Board's uh, statements were that AI will ensure appropriate human judgment and not replace it. Humans have to be at the core of these systems and humans have to be making the critical decisions and not giving full uh, autonomy to a autonomous system, but rather making sure that we're always in control of these systems. We aren't perfect, so the AI system will never be perfect. And that's why that monitoring is so important. We need to empower diverse teams and make inclusive environment environments. We need to encourage deep conversations across our teams and very um, diverse teams and activate curiosity, be speculative and imaginative. 
And uh, hopefully this will help you to design to, uh, systems to work with and for people and take that honeycomb and turn it into human-centered AI by understanding the complexity of context, designing for human machine teaming and engaging in critical oversight. And this is my contact information and I'm happy to chat more. And particularly if people wanna talk about the, the restaurant uh, situation, I was trying to make a, uh, a fairly approachable uh, uh, scenario there, but there are definitely issues. Um, okay, so a question, is there any interest in this effort to learn from life critical product owners like Ford, Boeing, General Dynamics, et cetera? Um, yeah, so they uh, heavily use principles from systems engineering and technical program management to address many of these issues and more. There could be a lot of benefit from bringing their skills and practices to this effort, definitely. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not working directly with those organizations, but certainly um, one of the projects I'm working on is looking at those types of practices and how to um, mature or modernize, I should say, them. So uh, a lot of the uh, activities, the processes that those um, organizations have used for um, aerospace and uh, vehicles um, is helpful, but it's not enough. It's, uh, it's definitely a good place to look, and many of those practices really need to be integrated into AI engineering, um, but they're not adequate because they are very much about systems that um, are not as dynamic as AI systems. And so uh, there's a lot of very early, very specific planning that goes on and, and um, documentation and, and requirements, um, but there isn't that ongoing continuous work that has to be done to keep these systems working well. Not that they're not doing maintenance, but it's a different, it's a different way of looking at a system. And so we need to figure out a way to make it um, more modern for these uh, new and still complex and incredibly life critical um, in many cases. Um, but, but it's just, it's a, it's a different problem. Wow, thank questions? you. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. So open the floor up to questions now and yeah. I'm gonna take a drink. <laughs> well learned, yeah. I think I, I think I want everyone to unmute themselves. You know, forgive me, I don't use Zoom very often. But yeah, yeah. yeah and then Harry, if you had more to add there, I'd be happy to uh, talk more about that. <laughs> but I, I do think there's a lot of information there that's very useful. Where, oh, where will the Croyon be posted? That's for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, that's, yeah. That, uh, I will post it out to everyone. I'm not sure yet. I need to talk to the, the rest of the team here. Uh, sort of new to this. So yes, I will post it. I'm sure it'll be somewhere online. Uh, yeah. Most likely social media and the website. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And, and Harry, the, you know, the, the interesting uh, points that you made about the, uh, the shift manager tool, those would be excellent. Uh, if, if someone was going to build the system, which I do not recommend they do for a variety of other reasons, besides the fact that you don't need AI to do scheduling <laughs> generally. Um, but uh, is, you know, so how, um, how would you incorporate those kinds of considerations into a system? How would you, uh, how would you frame the, uh, the team aspect of the humans? Uh, how do you communicate that? Can you communicate that to an AI system? I'm skeptical, but maybe you can. Um, you know, there are a lot of those conversations that are really important. And if the answer is no, it's okay to cancel a project. Like that, this part of this work is coming to the conclusion that this is not going to work. This is not going to improve the system. This is not an AI appropriate solution. And if not, okay, you know, what can we do to improve the situation with, with the existing software or, or another program or something else? It's, these systems are so incredibly complicated and expensive to build. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I try to do these talks so much as to help people understand that they're, you know, the, the old statement was we need an app for that. And now people say we need an AI for that. And it's not, 
a good reason to build one of these expensive and, and uh, incredibly time consuming systems. Okay, and the, okay, one more. TPM principles are independent of the effort, no matter how dynamic. It, I'm assuming you mean like a technical program manager, technical project manager there, I'm not sure. Um, no matter how dynamic and the large scale work in aerospace is highly dynamic, true. It takes years of massive change and adaptation to bring these products to maturity. Yes, it does. And aerospace is way ahead with regard to these types of systems. I, I would say aerospace is, I know this, probably you're going to disagree, but I think it's an easier, um, okay, technical program management. The, those words are interchangeable in, in my world. Um, the, uh, th that is an easier problem in many ways because planes do not have children crossing the street. Um, they're typically not uh, going to uh, have to deal with humans in the same you know, lane, <laughs> literally, um, on the ground uh, that a uh, um, a vehicle would, um, that there are a lot of much more complex problems. And that's one of the reasons why we've had, uh, you know, the ability to have uh, autopilot for so long, because that is something that a system, a computer system can do well. Um, but there, there are many, many, many other challenges uh, in these other systems that they can't do as well. And, and so um, it's not that those principles aren't important, <clears throat> excuse me, they are. Um, and it's not that that we can't do dynamic work with those, but these other systems just have a lot more, um, uh, there's just a lot more going on in some cases. Um, it, it's not that it can't work, it's just that, that a lot of these systems need even more flexibility. <laughs> and now you can unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not arguing about how complex aerospace is. I'm just saying it is clearly an area where progress has been made, and it has not been made in any other industry as much as aerospace. Um, and uh, let's say another question: uh, Would you say there's a go-to tool such as Sketch for its respective uses to create designs and prototypes for AI solutions? Oh, um, I, I think any tool is fine for um, thinking through interactions. I, um, I prefer uh, Figma, but whatever you prefer is fine. Um, you know, paper is always ideal first. The, the critical piece is really thinking through the complexity of the interactions, thinking about how the information is exchanged, uh, what is going on um, with regard to awareness, what happens as time moves on, um, really being able to think broadly and not, uh, you know, get too tied to one design um, is the most important piece. So uh, don't worry too much about the tool you're using right now. We may find, and I'm hoping we do find, that there are things that we can't do with those tools and we have more uh, need for, and, and someone hopefully will develop that tool, whatever it is. Um, but the, uh, you know, right now, I, I think whatever tools you have, it's what we've got. Uh, there's not a great tool out there for this because everything's so dynamic. Um, one of the things that ideally you can do is early prototyping with the AI system in a safe space. So not out in the open in the cloud, but you know in a controlled area where you can test it out with different uh, data, making sure that the system is working as anticipated and making sure that you're doing a lot of that early testing and prototyping before making the full system, or at least before putting the system out there for um, other people to interact with. Um, and uh, another question is, is it hard to ask the right questions and think broadly, do you have a piece of advice, tips for getting better at it? Uh, it is really hard to ask the right questions. It depends on the, the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so the best advice I can give for getting better at it is practicing. It's just doing this a lot. Um, there are some um, activity cards. Um, I'm not going to think of the name of them right now. Um, but, but any kind of brainstorming activities, just practicing brainstorming and practicing uh, critical thinking is the biggest piece. Uh, watching those shows like the Black Mirror show um, and all, I, I would encourage you to watch all um, sci-fi TV shows because uh, there was one that just came out with uh, Tom Hanks. Uh, what's it called? Anybody remember some guy's name? He had a, the character's name. Anyway, that, that one, if you look it up, has a lot of things to critique. <laughs> um, th there's always um, more out there and just, just getting better at, at uh, Finch. Yes, that's it. 
Uh, wow, I did not like that one at all. Um, but but it, it was good because it made me angry, and you know I had to critique what 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 is it about this? What is bothering me? What is what is the uh, the interactions that are being shown that I, I don't feel there's enough evidence being provided to the human, you know, those types of things that helps you to think more critically about these systems. Um, uh, Harry, I agree with you. I'm not arguing with you about systems engineering. I'm literally looking into it now. Um, it's just not enough. <laughs> um, but I, I will look into INCOS. I've not heard about that one. I will look at that one. Thank you. And any other ones that you have, I welcome, uh, you know, send them my way. I'd love to look into them more. Um, it's really hard to find that information because a lot of it is behind uh, paywalls. And, uh, and it's hard to know if it's worth paying for the paywall. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not suggesting any specific um, engineering because I'm, not, I'm being completely technology agnostic or industry agnostic, I should say. Um, a lot of the people here are probably making recommender systems or uh, making chatbots or similar types of technology and not making uh, systems of that, that level. It's, it's pretty rare that people are working with those types of systems. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. I can hang out for a while. If, if I don't know when this meeting ends. <laughs> I think it's fine. I mean, yeah, if everyone wants to hang out for a bit more. Um, Great. That's fine. If we feel we've, our brains are about to explode, uh, that's good too. I think it was very well done, very well said. Awesome. And, and again, I'm always happy to have these conversations and uh, please reach out if you uh, if you have any uh, any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to talk more. <laughs>